Sun, radiant in splendor, glory, delight, banishing darkness with swords of great light. It's Jesus, the breaker, standing before us, moving the darkness we are as one chorus. Beyond the narrow, our capacity enlarged, he encourages us forward as he leads us in the charge. A formation of believers in friendship with God, assembling together to expose the old fraud. The bigger the mission, the greater the win. For those who are with him, the closest of friends. This era is different. As he wills his words, I look all around me, only kings and lords. What lies before us are things never seen. This impossible kingdom that's beyond the explained. Jesus says, I have spoiled his plans. I have attacked his attack. Now is the time I'm going to give back. Multiplication is on its way. It will come in the areas of need and desire. So be steadfast and say, be multiplied, be multiplied. Multiplication is mine. Go forward into this plan. Move forward, be steady and take your stand. As you open your heart, I will open your eyes, look at what's coming, and a much surprise, experience things you've never had before. The evidence will stack up, then there will come even more. It's so good to have you here today. I also want to remind you that Friday night at 5 o'clock is our candlelight service. So don't miss that this coming Friday. And uh, you want to be a part of that. I don't know if you've ever been here uh, during candlelight service. It's a phenomenal experience, and God's presence always fills this place as we're here to celebrate Him, Amen. the one who did it all for us. Amen. Amen. Uh, I'd like to do what I always do on uh, Sunday morning, and that is just to speak out of my heart. And uh, for some of you, you don't even know what the breaker, that the that quote and those prophetic words are all about. These are, were the prophetic words that he gave us, the Holy Spirit gave us, coming into 2021 as he is so faithful to do. And uh, what stands out about, about this to me is, and I, and I think we can all agree, that in this year and through these series, you've come to know Jesus, the breaker, like you never have before. Amen. And I believe you will never, 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 never see him differently than what we've explained to you and defined to you according to the great prophetic words of the prophet Micah. Amen. He is the breaker. Now, there's uh, this era is different. Did you get that part? This era is different as he wields his sword. As he wields his word, remember the, the Bible says that the sword of the Spirit is the word of God, that the sword comes out of his mouth. Amen? It's words. The reason I wanted to call your attention to that specifically is because that also is in the pro prophecy that he's given us for 22. This era is different. An era speaks of a new, a new day, a new age, a new time, a beginning of, of uh, uh, what the world is called the new normal, okay? But this is not just defining or explaining the world. This is explaining a new era for the church, a new era for the body of Christ, and that's what we need to take away from. Jesus, remember, was sent to the world. The Holy Spirit was sent to the church. Amen? And so when Jesus ascended into heaven, he said, I'm going to send to you another uh, person. It's the Holy Ghost. When he sent him, he sent him to the church. And if you consider yourself a Christian, a part of the church, then you ought to have a really tight-knit relationship with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Let's uh, go ahead and finish, complete our series, The Breaker. Like I said, um, I have some tugging, some pulling, some urgings, some unctions in going several different directions. 
And so I'm going to try to just be faithful to listen to his voice and follow his, his promptings. Amen. Um, I think for far too long, and I, I believe you would agree with this, for far too long we've had people that have had no authentic kingdom experiences telling us what we should or shouldn't believe. Now, we allowed them to do that. Now, it might have been out of our ignorance or stupidity, maybe out of we just didn't even know better. But what that has done for many Christians, it, is, is it has uh, robbed them of their imagination. It shut down their imagination. And yet God appeals to our imagination in order to capture our hearts. This is why Jesus taught in parables. He would say the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of God is like unto that. You see. And he would, like any great script writer, he would draw his audience into the storyline of what he was trying to get across to them. He was the master storyteller. Amen. And still is even to this day. But he would use that to capture or to, he would use that to appeal to their imagination in order to eventually capture their hearts. God is still doing this even today. Amen. This is one way, not the only way, but one way that God gets things across to us. It's a language that he speaks. He appeals to our imagination. And because we've fallen for people that, uh, and we're always going to have naysayers. We're always going to have people that say, oh, that's not possible. Oh, God's not doing things like that anymore. This, that, and the other. And it's robbed us, and it's shut down our imagination, and that has to be restored. Now, you know what it's like to use purposefully your imagination. At one time, you may or may not have, you dreamed or you imagined being married. You imagined having a family. You imagined moving into your first home. I remember as a kid, I imagined the, the moment that I was going to get my first car. It was a 1980 Trans Am, turbo Trans Am, fresh off the showroom floor with a turbo. And a turbo back in those days was like unusual. I, I owned that car for two years. I had saved up money, enough money working on an oil rig to pay for that car. And I bought it right off the showroom, and I burned up three turbos in two years. <laughs> I was an 18-year-old hell on wheels, buddy. <laughs> Amen. But I was a Christian hell on wheels. How's that? <laughs> um, and uh, so you know what it's like to imagine. I just imagined myself having that car until I said, Okay, I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm going to go down there and pay for this car. Remember what it's like you, when you, you imagine building that dream home. Amen. Maybe you're still imagining that. That's okay. Maybe you're, you, you've imagined if you're, if you're, if you're uh, you know, especially guys, you think of there's a certain type of car that you want to own. You just don't own it yet. So you're imagining that, see. And you know what it's like to use your imagination when you're in the pain of a crisis and you go to your imagination to escape that reality. Don't lie to me. I know you do. Even if it's for just a few minutes or, or a few hours, you go there to escape your current reality. God knew you would. Ephesians says this. God speaking said, that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or imagine. Amen. He wants us to re-engage our imagination. Now, because we believe those people who had no authentic kingdom experiences, and we let them lead us and talk us out of things that God wants to do for us, literally that's robbed us of many experiences that God wanted us to possess in our lifetime. Amen? And so it's important... That in this moment, and, and, and honestly, to tell you the truth, this isn't just an issue with this generation, but this has been a problem for many generations prior to ours. And it's delayed the times and seasons of God. This is what we see in the book of Daniel, that the enemy comes to delay the times and seasons that are in God's hands. This is God's intention 
This is God's purpose for what he wants to do in a certain specific season. And so the enemy comes to do everything he can to delay that and postpone that and keep that from happening. And he's been a master at doing that with religious people, using religious people to stop the plan and the purposes of God. You staying with me? But I'm going to tell you, God is revisiting us in our imagination. And if you're open to it, he's going to give you opportunities to catch up. It's time to catch up. That's today's session. It's time to catch up. Now, I want us to, one of the ways that we do that is by asking ourselves this question. Is my relationship, or I'll, I'll, I'll use this as a body of people, is our relationship with God tangible or is it conceptual? You have to answer that question yourself. I can't answer it for you. I have to answer it for myself. That is, let me go, go a little deeper and explain it. Does God occupy this part or this space of my life, in other words, the intellect, and of course, only when it's convenient, only at my convenience, only on Sunday morning, occasionally when I feel like going to church, or when I'm really desperate, or really when I'm in need, all of a sudden, God occupies, and I include him in my thinking. See, it's conceptual. Or, is our relationship with God, is it... God occupies any space and any place that he wants to in any area of my life. Do we limit him here to our concept? Have you built a concept of God and there he is? Or has God just spilled out of your intellect, out of your heart into every other area of your life? That's a... That's a, that's a uh, <laughs> That's a, something that you have to answer yourself. Have you ever experienced God in your imagination? Have you ever experienced God in your emotion? You felt him. You ever experienced God in your circumstance? You prayed the prayer of faith. He invaded your situation, changed it for good, turned it completely around, and had you go in the other direction. And you could honestly say when it was all said and done, you might have said this, I don't know how that happened, but when you boiled it all down, you should have said, or I should have said, it was God that did that. <laughs> Do you know him that way? Do you know him in your relationships? Someone walks up to you, says something just out of the blue, and you go, oh, my gosh, that was God speaking to me through that person. Do you know him in your finances? Have you allowed him into that area of your life? Do you know him in your physical body? This is really the focal point today, the physical body. Do you know him as the healer? Do you know him as the one that you were sick or someone you knew was sick and you prayed the prayer of faith for healing and he came in and supernaturally healed you or healed that person you prayed over? Do you know him that way? Amen? You see, it is a spirit-ruled person that releases God into those other areas of their life. It is a spirit-ruled person. It is a person that lives out of their heart, out of their spirit. Those two words are interchangeable. Lives out of their spirit. They are the ones that release God out of their intellect, and they stop conceptualizing him, and they let him out into other, every area of their life with no, no limitations, no containment. No, uh, God, you can go anywhere, but not here. Right. Amen? Amen? Now, the reason this is important is because if we're going to catch up to the times and the seasons that God has called the church to, that God has called the individual believer but also the corporate church to come together and to fulfill his assignment and his plans. Let me, let me give you an FYI, okay? You're going to hear me say this in 22. Your purpose is not to make money. That's not why you're here on the earth. Amen. Your purpose is here to honor God. Amen. That's why you're here. 
I'm telling you, this will separate the this will separate the sheep from the goats, the chaff from the wheat. We got to know our purpose. Now, sixth chapter of Matthew, he said, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God, and you'll seek God first, all the other things will be added to you. Amen. Things, things, what things? Money, resources, material things. Amen. You check the box. Now, notice that. Separate this out. I was going to save this for the next session. Separate this out. Think about this. He didn't tell you, seek God till you find him. And then all the things will be added. You don't even have to find him. If you'll just seek him, he'll get involved in your life. If you'll just seek him, he didn't say, I'm holding back on the reward until you find me. Like that, you know, like some family loses their dog and puts a poster up on the telephone pole and says, if you find there's a five, if you find my dog, it's a $500 reward. And then you go to them and say, well, knock on their door and you say, well, I've been looking for your dog. I've been seeking your dog. Well, did you find him? Well, yeah, no, I haven't, but I want the reward. But God says, you don't even have to find me. If you just diligently seek me, I will give you the rewards. That, that ought to make you shout in this house this morning. Just seek me. Just be diligently, diligent about seeking me. Just do that. Amen? Now, this is how we catch up because I want you to <laughs> conceptualize this. Okay? If our relationship with God is only conceptual, then, or should I say merely conceptual, then our faith is at the mercy of logic. Our, ma- our, our, our faith will always be held as a hostage to our logic. There is no faith in the head. Faith is in the heart. Amen. You came, your salvation experience is just like mine. I've said this over the last couple of weeks, but somebody needs to hear it. Your salvation experience was just like mine. Nobody, no theologian set you down and taught you the whole Bible in order for you to finally accept Jesus. And when you invited him in, you didn't invite him into your head. You invited him into your heart. And so it's so important that we not not limit our relationship with him to concepts lest our faith be held hostage to our logic. In other words, we have to understand it. You have to explain it before I'll do it or before I'll believe it. You talk about holding us back. That holds us back. Amen. Now, what that does is, you know, uh, a conceptual, what I'm going to call a a conceptualized Christian, a Christian that conceptualizes everything. This is what I've discovered. It's created frustrated Christians. It's created Christians or believers that they're, uh, they abandon their faith. Okay? They're on the path, then they get off the path. They're on the path, they're back on the path, off the path. They come back on the path, then they're back off the path. And then they come back on the path, and then they go back off the path. And the Bible says a double-minded man or woman is unstable in all their ways. Let them not think they'll receive anything from the Lord. And you talk about uh, challenging your faith that's already weak. It'll rob you of your faith. By holding God as a mere concept in your intellect, in your mind, it robs you of your faith. He has to spill out of that place. Like a like a virus. And infect every area of your existence. Amen. Another thing it does when we, we have conceptualized Christians, then it, it, the challenge for them is they may even know the language of faith, the vernacular of faith. It's just they don't live by faith. They've conceptualized God. He's right here. And it keeps them from catching up to what God wants to do in their generation. Amen. Tell your neighbor it's time to catch up.
Now, I want us to take that thinking over in as we, again, as we conclude this series, Breaker. Take that, take what I've said, take the things that we've said about imagination. I'm gonna, I want to appeal to your imagination to capture your heart by going back to what the great prophet Micah prophesied thousands of years ago. Let's not get hung up on uh, what he was prophesying about so far back then that came to pass. But let's look at the pattern in which God used, uses to gather people. To gather people. And we, we've shown you in the book of Acts, uh, the, the early church, we showed you that God did the very same thing. He gathered with what? Anybody remember this open book test? He gathered with what? Revelation. People gather, humanity gathers with a lot of different things. God only gathers with one thing. He gathers with revelation. This is how you know it's authentic. This is that revelation is a confirmation. Oh, that God's gathering. God's gathering. And we should recognize that. If we don't, we ought to ask why. Amen. Now, let's let's put this pattern together. Notice he said, I will surely assemble, I will surely gather, I will put them together as a flock in the midst of their foe. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude. So this is not a small gathering, this is not a medium-sized gathering, this is a great gathering. And who's putting them together? Who's bringing them together? And isn't it interesting, again, our vision statement is bringing God and people together. Amen? And he gave, us to, gave that to us years ago. So, notice this, not until God gathers a numerical quota of people to the person, not until he's gathered them to the person, and we will see this throughout Scripture in in next year, in 22. I'm going to show it to you over and over and over again. To a person. He has a numerical quota, and then when he gets to that, that quota is met to the person, then all of a sudden Jesus appears before him. The breaker comes up before him. But he just doesn't hang out in the gathering. He immediately takes them into action. Notice what he said. And, and the breakers come up before them. They're broken up. They've passed through the gate and are gone out by it. And their King Jesus shall pass before them and the Lord Jesus on the head of them. So this is what happens. So there's this great pasture. You see it. Here's the sheep going through this narrow gate into a new pasture. And this is your faith journey. To go from one green pasture through a narrow gate experience to the next green pasture to a narrow gate experience to the next green pasture through a narrow gate experience and on and on and on it goes. Let's look at Proverbs uh, uh, fourth chapter. But the path of the just, notice we're, we, we need a path because we're walking. We're running on this path. Amen? We're going forward. The path of the just. Who, how many know the Bible says the just shall live by faith so this is who he's talking about the path of the just that lives by faith is as the shining light that shineth more and more and we could just keep going and more and more and more and more and more and more unto a perfect day okay the perfect day is the day that you finally arrive at a high altitude pasture amen so <laughs> We're, we're going to dissect this, okay? Because some of you go, some of you going, I know, but I don't like going through that narrow gate experience. <laughs> it's scary. <laughs> Did you notice how quick those sheep went through that narrow gate? Mm -hmm. They didn't hang out at the gate. Mm -hmm. Amen. This, is, this is why Scripture tell us, tells us weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. That narrow gate experience <laughs> that we go through is never supposed to be a long time. Yep. Amen? So don't be afraid of it. What that narrow gate is, is, is doing is it's, is it's taking us from one pasture where the resources have already been used up. This previous pasture is limited in its, in its resources. It only has so much capacity. And so he's leading us through a narrow gate into a greater pasture. 
with more capacity, more resources, more signs, wonders, miracles, healings, deliverances, and salvations. More things are ahead of us. The best is, hasn't happened. The best is yet to come. Amen. Amen. So we have to get to the point where we accept it. This is our journey. Accept this as your journey. I'm supposed to, now, life, life, let me tell you, the unbeliever, they're going through a similar experience. Amen? You know, we would say it like this, well, you know, life just happens. Sometimes they use four-letter words to explain happens. See? But if we, as the body of Christ, as a church, as Christians, would just wrap our mind around the intent and the purpose of this, then when we go through that narrow gate and get out on the other side of it, we'll know there was a purpose for it, a reason for it. And then we'll have a certain expectation of it. Accept this. Accept this. If you do, then you'll begin to catch up. Amen? Tell your neighbor it's time to catch up. Now imagine, imagine with me. Um, imagine if you would, just take it a moment in time. At a, at, a, at, a, at a place where God came into your world and you experienced his power. Don't, don't take a bunch of them, just one. Just look at one. Imagine it for just a moment. God came into that experience that you were heavy, having and he changed it. His power came and manifested he came in and did the impossible. He did a miracle. He showed you a sign. You stepped back and you wondered, how did that happen? Who, who, I don't know. Was that God? I'm not sure. That kind of experience. Now, what did that look up here? What did that do to your faith? When that happened, what did it do? Your faith, it, it just rose. It just rose up in that moment. But now, let me ask you this question. What did you do with that? Was that temporary faith? Or was that everlasting faith? The, the, point, the, the point is, did, did you maintain that level of faith that it rose to? Amen? Because Jesus, he would send his disciples through a narrow gate experience, a faith test. Okay? And then at the end of, the, at the end of it, when they failed, he would say, Oh, you of little faith. Now, see, Jesus was a great mentor. These were, these were his students. He was going to leave the kingdom of God in their care. So he's mentoring them here at, here at Pathpoint. We teach, we train, we activate. We teach, we train, we activate. We don't teach, just teach. And you can be here and, and, and you can be acting like you're listening, but if you're really listening, you're learning. Amen? But only when you're learning, then can we lead you over into training. And then only when we're training, then we'll put you into a point where you activate it. You activate what you've learned. Amen? How I many were in school and you fake the teacher, like me, you fake the teacher out. She thought you were listening. <laughs> but you were daydreaming. That's me. Amen? Especially in math class. Now, teach, train, activate, teach, train, activate. That's what Jesus was doing with his disciples. And when they would fail a faith test, he would say, oh, you of little faith, that word little there, and it actually means short-term. Oh, you of short-term faith. Oh, you had great faith. And then it rose to a certain level only for you to allow it to collapse and to shrink back. Amen. Think of Peter. Let's just think of this great disciple, Peter. Let's think of all the signs, wonders, miracles, healings, deliverances of demon possessions, all these salvations that he witnessed Jesus perform. Think of it. Now then think about how Peter also participated with Jesus in miracles along with other disciples. How about the miracle of feeding the 4,000? Peter and the disciples were very much a part of that miracle. Feeding of the 5,000. It was Jesus and Peter that walked on water. 
You see that? But now think about this. At the narrow gate of crucifixion, Peter walked away from his faith. He abandoned his faith. His faith didn't abandon him. His faith was available, accessible, ready, set. I mean, it was poised. I'm ready to do something here. But Peter just walked away at that narrow gate, that faith test called the crucifixion. And we, knew, we know what it took Jesus to do to restore Peter. Amen? After the resurrection. What Peter's life teaches us is that when we go through a na- narrow gate experience and we have success, we are to maintain that level of faith right. at that point of success and not let it shrink back. Because if he would have and not had temporary faith but long, everlasting, long-lasting faith, then what would have happened? He would have passed the test of the crucifixion. You grabbing hold of this? Now, uh, I was, we were coming into, well, let me, let me give you two stories. Here's, here's one. So in 2020, we paid this campus off. Okay? So we have a campus here of 4 or $5 million, and we owe no man anything. Well, I had been speaking, and I'm saying this because some of you are trying to figure out how do I activate my faith, activate my faith. I'd been activating my faith for years because some of you know my story, how I came out of poverty. So I had to literally continue the process that my mom and dad had gone on to break the spirit of poverty off my life. And, 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 and so I moved out of poverty out of that spirit of poverty, but I was still living in scarcity and lack. And so I knew the battle wasn't over with. I haven't got complete, I haven't got complete success or victory here. I have to continue what my mom and dad started. I have to continue the process of, with my faith, fighting off the spirit of lack and scarcity. I believe, just in case, Missy, you didn't know, I believe that's one reason God called us here. Because of the journey I was on. Sorry, you came along with me. <laughs> and so, and so, there we are in 2020. We pay this thing off. And the Holy Spirit said to me one day when I was praying, He said, now what are you going to do with your faith? Now, let me show you this, and then I'll get back to the story. The way you activate your faith is the same way you came into your salvation experience. You say with your mouth and you believe in your heart. This is how you live the life of faith. You can't just think it. You've got to say it. You've got to speak the word of God out of your mouth with a believing heart. Oh, I believe that. I believe that. Well, that's what I was doing. I was taking the word of God. There's rarely a time, a rarely a day that goes by that I don't quote scripture, pray scripture from a believing heart. I speak it by faith. No weapon of sickness, bacteria, virus, disease, plague, calamity, tragedy, COVID-19, any of its variants, no scarcity, no lack, no poverty, no insufficiency of resources of any kind will come nigh my dwelling. And any of those condemning tongues that rise up against me to challenge me, I condemn them right now. I shut them down. They're a lying tongue, and they cannot manifest in my life from this day forward. Now, I pray that, hey, hey, those of you who are members, I pray that over you almost every day. As I'm looking at your picture, and I'll insert your name there. Okay, oh, by the way, let me just give you an... uh, A little information. Our membership class is full in February. So our capacity has been met. And so we realize there's some of you that have let us know you want to be a part of that that next membership class. So we'll have to move you to April. So we'll have another membership class in April. And uh, that capacity is also limited. So first come, first serve. We don't mean to do this to you. We're not doing it intentionally. It's just we're limited in this area. So uh, just uh, if you, you have a connect card there in front of you, you can let us know how many of you want to be at the next, the April membership class. See, I go through, down through here, and I'll pray over Donna Jackson. I'll go down through here, and I'll pull out 
uh, you know, uh, just different people, Ray Lynn, Leon, and Elicio, and Tanner LeMaster, and Kelsey LeMaster, and I'll just see their face, and I'll just ask the Holy Spirit, what, you would, what would you have me pray over them and speak over them and declare by faith over them? This is what a pastor's supposed to do. Amen. Amen. So that's what I do. I'm obligated not to you to do that. I'm obligated to him to do that. He is the master shepherd. I'm just under his authority. I tell, I tell people all the time, the, the, the thing that we do best here at Pathpoint Fellowship Church is we follow. We follow the Holy Spirit. We follow his voice. This is what we do. And what it does is it takes the, the pressure off of us to, to lead people somewhere that, they, that God never intended them for them to wind up. Right. Amen? No, this is the Holy Spirit. We're just going to follow the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? And so you can literally say this. There are no leaders here. We're all just followers. Amen? And I found that following is one of the easiest things you can do. Amen? Puts all the pressure on the leader, doesn't it? All that pressure's on him, not me. And he does really well with pressure. I don't, but he does. Amen? What, what is the old saying? Worst decisions you'll ever make is because you're, because of the, you're under that pressure. Pressure is the mother of all wrong decisions. Amen? Put the pressure on him. Amen? So there he said to me, what are you going to do with that faith now? Oh, he was letting me know. Don't let that faith shrink back. Right. You've built great faith in this area here. Amen? And so I said, I don't know. I'm not, never try to fake it or wing it with God. <laughs> Just tell him, if you don't know, I don't know. You, some of you have come up to me over the years, and you've asked me a question, and I would say to you, I don't know. Because at that moment in time, I'm not hearing anything. Because I'm not going to answer of my own accord, my own ability, my own intellect. I'm going to answer when I get his answer. And if I go quiet on you, it's because I'm listening. So you know what I'm talking about. You've experienced this about me. I'm just going to shut up until he shows up and says what he says because he will always be accurate. Amen. I, I don't play games with people's lives. Amen? Now, so a few weeks later, he asked me again, what are you going to do with that faith? Don't let it sit there. It'll shrink back on you. It'll fall to the level that it was before you started building faith. And I said, I know what I want. I know what my desire is. He said, what is it? I said that Path Point Fellowship Church experiences more signs, wonders, miracles, healings, deliverances, and salvations. And so I'm expecting you every Sunday from this day forward, every time we gather together, I'm expecting you to be in our midst for the purpose of signs, wonders, miracles, healings, deliverances, and salvations. And I've been connecting my faith there ever since. Amen. Now, that's one story. Here's another one. About six, five or six months before the pandemic, we didn't even know what they were calling it yet. The Holy Spirit led me to the sixth chapter of Ephesians, and I started praying this. And I, one of the things I was doing with this is I was going to be teaching a lay ministry class on Tuesday nights, uh, and uh, he wanted me to use this as a core position or foundational, this scripture, as a foundational scripture for this lay ministry class. It says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And so I kept going over there, and I would teach out of it on Tuesday nights. And then one day he said to me, Now go over there. See, because I had memorized that scripture a long time ago. He said, Now go over to the sixth chapter. And so I started looking at it. He said, Read that whole chapter. And I started reading it, and he says, Put on the whole 
armor of God. And I read it out loud, and he said, you're going to need that. You're going to need that since you've become lax at putting on the armor of God. You're going to need that for what's coming. He said it to me just like that. Put on the whole armor of God, one translation says, that you may stand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, that you'll be able to stand. Well, this pandemic is evil. I told you coming into it that it was accompanied by an angel of death. And sure enough, it has. Put on the whole armor of God. And he said, you put on each one of those pieces of equipment and you say it out loud. I put on the helmet of salvation. I put on the breastplate of righteousness. I put on the belt of truth. I put on the, my, my uh, gospel shoes of peace. I hold up that shield of faith whereby I quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. I wield the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It comes out of my mouth. And I put on that, those pieces of equipment every day. And he said, don't you leave the house with that armor, without that armor. I put that armor on every time I come to church. You know why? Because, you, you know, you may have the virus and you're just a carrier. You don't even know you have it. And you know what? That virus wants to get on me. I quench every fiery dart of COVID-19 and every one of its variants in Jesus' name. I trust that armor. That's not Scott's armor. That's God's armor. When that variant looks at me, when that, when that COVID-19 looks at me, it says, oh, that's God in there. That's God in there. When do we, when, when, when do we, I haven't got COVID-19. I will not get it. I'm wearing that armor. Now, if you've gotten it, or you, you know, and here's another thing. You, you got strep going around. You got stomach bug going around. You got this. Put that armor on. Speak that word. Put it on one piece of equipment at a time. Or you can be like so many other people. You get caught up in the hospital. You lay in bed. Amen? Put the armor on. It's worth your five minutes. To do it. It'll save you hours and hours and hours. And yet, that's accessible to us as Christians. And yet, you have to put the armor on. God won't do it for you. I can't do it for you. You can't do it for me. I have to put it on myself. If I'm going anywhere, I'm going on a trip here in the next couple of days. I promise you, I will spend time with my angels. I will spend time with my armor. And I will make sure that I am spiritually ready for this trip. Amen. Do the same. Just do the same. Do what you know to do. He that knoweth to do good, doeth it. Do it. Because if you don't, it's sin to not do it. Don't let things slip away that God has taught us. Because when we, when we become lax in an area that we once were excited about because it was a revelation when it was spoken out the first time, and then we put it aside because we're reaching for the next revelation and the excitement of the next revelation because there's great energy in it. And then the Lord said, stop. You need, to, you need to go back there to the basics. Just go back to what you fundamentally know to do and do it. How many of you know to do that takes faith? Because <laughs> you don't want to do it. Amen? The new has worn off. It's like that new car. You washed it every week until it was three weeks old. And it's like, I'm not going to wash it. I'm not going to vacuum it out. <laughs> Maybe Missy will do it for me. Amen? See, don't let the newness of the Word of God wear off. Do what you know to do. Amen. Do it by faith. Now, I said all that to say the way that we activate our faith is we speak it. We speak whatever we're believing for. 
We speak it into existence. We grab, we find it in the word of God, and then we let it come out of our mouth from a believing heart. Irregardless of what area of life you're believing God for, then find that scripture, have it coming out of your mouth. Amen? Speak it with a believing heart. Oh, God, I know you're going to do this. I know you're going to do this. I know you're going to do this for me. Amen? Amen? He's faithful. This is one way or one, some of the ways that we can catch up. Now, let's watch this. Did I appeal to your imagination? Huh? Don't ask me to slow down. It's time to catch up. Amen? You talk about a narrow gate experience. It's called a pandemic. Will you use your faith in a pandemic? Because if you will... Day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out, and you outlast your opponent, your faith will rise. It will rise. Even if you've already had COVID-19, you've already been sick. Hey, praise God, you didn't die. Here you are. Now you get a, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. Let's outlast our opponent. Amen? Let's do this and catch up. Get our faith to a point where it catches up to all the previous and prior revelations that God has already poured down on the inside of you. And when it came across as brand new, you were excited about it. You, you, you applied it to your life. And then somewhere down the line, like me, I put it down to reach for something else, something new. Something that's fresh out of the box. And you can't do it. You got to go back there. Amen. Because that power that's in that is forever. Amen. Now, <laughs> you ready? I'm going to turn a corner here. God's first language is not English. He uses many various languages. I've told you over the last few years that God speaks in the language of coincidence. He speaks in the language of dreams, the language of visions. But let me, let me also say that God speaks in the language of where he will, just, he will just drop a mental picture, a mental picture down on the inside of you. He will drop a phrase, a sentence that will run through your intellect, through your thought life. That's God speaking to you. Sometimes he'll just make an impression in your heart. It's just you, you're impressed. Your heart is impressed by this. He's put something in there. Sometimes you sense something he's saying. You discern it. Sometimes he, you feel it. It's God speaking to you. Amen? Now, here's what I want you to see. When we ignore any of these, we are at least sometimes ignoring his voice. Don't ignore his voice. He, he will literally use your physical senses to speak to you. You have to anticipate his voice. One of the things coming into this pandemic, the, the, the Holy Spirit said to me, now listen to me every day. Listen to me every day. Even though you have your armor on, listen to me every day. I'll tell you where to go. I'll tell you where not to go. Be faithful. Now, I have a schedule just like you do. Now, my schedule is probably a little more lax than yours. But he, he will protect you when your schedule forces you into an area. He will protect you if you put your arm on. Amen? But listen to the Holy Spirit. 
Listen to the Holy Spirit. He will lead you. He will. There, there have been times I've been somewhere like at, like at the uh, gym or something like that, and I would just, the Holy Spirit would say, just stop right here for a minute. These people will walk by. These people will walk by. They say, okay, you can go now. Yeah, it's not just about protection. It is that. It, it, he's wanting to know if you're listening. Will you just listen? Sometimes he tells me, you need to wear a mask in there. Sometimes he doesn't say anything. When he doesn't say anything, okay. Amen? He wants to know that you know that you're in relationship with him and that you're listening to him and that he's leading you. Now, you remember the, in the, uh, I believe it's Mark, the sixth chapter, there's Jesus. He sent his disciples out ahead of him. They've, got in, they've gotten in a boat, and there they are, uh, and, and Jesus has stayed on the shoreline. Now, here he is as a mentor. L look at, look at there, there's something supernatural with what's going on here because it says that they're out there in the middle of the lake. Let's just read it, and I'll try to dissect it. Now, when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea. We know that, we know that sea was eight miles wide, so they're four miles out there, and he's on the shore. How can he see them? He was alone then, and he saw them straining at rowing, for a wind was against him. I guarantee you, this is what he did. He went there in his image, in his imagination. He went where they were, and he literally saw them up close and personal. He knew they were straining. He knew they were struggling. You couldn't see that from the shoreline. Amen. So, the wind was against them. Now, about the fourth watch of the night, that's 3 o'clock in the morning, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. Uh, the one translation said he intended to just walk right by them. Just because Jesus is nearby doesn't mean he's going to get in your boat. You may, you've been there. I know I have. I'm out there in life, and I'm rowing, and I'm working, and I'm sweating, and I'm straining, and the wind of circumstances is blowing against me. I'm having, I'm not having a good day. Huh? Jesus is nearby, but that doesn't mean he's going to get in my boat. Right. Jesus responds to faith. He responds to the voice of faith. Remember in the first chapter of Mark, it says the kingdom of God is at hand. One translation says the kingdom of God is within reach. The kingdom of God doesn't respond to me. I can't just expect it to do whatever I want. The only way I can reach into the kingdom of God and pull out the results I'm looking for that I can't get from this reality, I can get from that supernatural reality is I have to activate my faith. I have to reach in there by faith and I have to pull it out by faith. The kingdom of God responds to faith. Amen? Now, you get anything out of this? Uh, please, please, please. Don't miss the physical signs that God will use in order to speak to you, to get your attention. With Moses, he used a burning bush. Be looking for the physical signs of the kingdom. He will give you those physical signs and then anticipate God's voice. What are you saying to me through that physical sign? What are you saying to me? Ask out loud. Exactly. That's right. Talk to him out loud like you, like you would a person who's in the room with you. Amen. When, when I, I remember that during that time when I was wearing a mask at the gym, I told Anthony here, I said, I loved it. You know why? Because I could get in there, I could pray. Nobody see my mouth moving. I could pray in the spirit. Nobody even see. All they see is a smile in my eyes. I'm using that mask. Amen. Now, when I was a kid, even when I, even into my teenage years, even into my twenties, preachers in those days 
would use a scripture that's found in Matthew, the 26th chapter. It says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And they would preach to us not to trust our flesh. Don't trust your physical body. Don't trust your five physical senses. You can't trust it. Ignore it. Avoid it. In fact, you probably need to go to war with it. And, and I remember the day I got a revelation. You know, if I'm so busy nitpicking me, then the devil can just sit over there on a stool and say, oh, I'll just let him beat himself up today with condemnation and guilt. He didn't have to pass along anything. I, I'm guilting myself. I'm condemning myself. I'm making myself. What, I, what was I doing? I was listening to someone who never had experienced an authentic kingdom of God, and he was telling me what I should believe. You need to believe that you should avoid your five physical senses and you should not trust your physical body. It's a lie. Now, here's the, here's the point. Don't war against your flesh. Win your flesh to your spirit. Amen. Win it. Win it. Let it know. Let it know. Show it. You see, I get one level of success when I have experience with God, and you get another level of success if you try to do it in your own ability. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, here's why this is important. Because we should all arrive at this point, fifth chapter of Hebrews. Let's look at this. But strong meat, that's revelation. Strong meat is revelation. Belonging to them that are full age, mature. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised. It is reasonable to exercise your senses, your five physical senses, to discern both good and evil. Now that's not just to make a distinction between what's good and evil, but go ahead and venture into, this is good, God's in that. Here's what God is doing. Oh, I sent you doing that, God. Oh, you, you've impressed on my heart that this is what you're doing. Oh, you gave me a mental picture that this is what you're doing. That's good, that's good. You're taking what the devil meant for harm, and you're turning it for my good. Now, I'm going to promise you this. There's coming a day that this is going to be common to the body of Christ. This is going to be common for Christians. They're going to be able to listen to their five physical senses and they're going to hear God through them. Amen. It's coming. It's coming. Now, whether it comes in this generation or not is up to you. Well, you can literally taste, smell, hear, touch, see. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Amen. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in my eyes. Amen. He wants us to get to a point where we win our five physical senses so that they too can be engaged in the process of our relationship with him to move him from being a concept, a principle, a religion, a doctrine, and move him over into the tangible areas of our lives. Did you get anything out of this this morning? Yeah. Give the Lord praise in this house. Now, who, who's that here this morning that um, you have stiffness in your joints? You may even have arthritis. Maybe you've even been diagnosed. Who's here? You've been diagnosed with arthritis. Anybody here like that? Okay. Come here. Come here. Come to me. Come to me. You've been diagnosed with arthritis. Whether that be rheumatoid arthritis, whether whatever arthritis it is. This is I've I've been I've been speaking and building my faith in this area over you for over five days. Every day. And he keeps pulling me over there, pulling me over there. Pull, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna deal with that. Now, here's what the Holy Spirit said to me going into next year. He said, listen, more is not better. Now, what he means by that, he said to me, 
Quit trying to deal with every symptom in the room. Deal with one symptom and you'll get a better result. You don't have faith for all those symptoms. Just hone in on one symptom, one diagnosis, one problem. Just hone in on that. And then I'm going to give you the word of knowledge prior to the Sunday that you're going to minister to those people. And when I give you that word of knowledge, that'll be the symptom you deal with. Well, he started talking to me about arthritis, arthritis, arthritis. And then all of a sudden, I started feeling arthritis in my body. And so as I spoke and I prayed and I spoke and I prayed, then I, I, he always leads me to a place where I say, where he says to me, now you speak to him and say, that's not mine. That's on somebody else. And so I did. And the moment I did it, boom, symptoms were gone. Well, guess what? That tells me that he was prophesying those symptoms on your body being gone. He was prophesying it. First of all, giving us a word of knowledge and then prophesying, but it's broken. It's gone. Here's Jesus, the breaker. He's come up before you to break that arthritis off your body, off your physical body. Amen. You believe that? Say, I believe it. Say this. I renounce arthritis. Call it by its name if you know specifically what it is. Okay. I break that now off my body in Jesus' name. I cut all ties with the diagnosis, with the curse of this symptom, with a generational curse if it was passed down to me. I'm not going to live in this temple. This is the temple of the Holy Ghost. He's not going to share this temple with arthritis. <laughs> he is the Holy Ghost. That's wholeness. Say, say it after me. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. saturate my physical body. From the top of my head to the soles of my feet, every cell come into alignment to the God's promise of healing. Now, in just a second, I'm going to touch you. And when I touch you, I'm going to impart the power of healing into your body. I'm not going to say anything. And then these people, as the Holy Spirit directs them, these are the seven redemptive gifts up here represented. Let me explain to you. Jesus had the Spirit without measure. You and I have the Spirit with measure. But if you put all seven redemptive gifts together, you put the full measure of the Spirit, and that's why they'll be touching you too. Amen? We're not going to just go down the line. We're going, to touch, we're going to go to wherever the Holy Spirit leads us to touch whoever, whenever. Amen. So go ahead and close your eyes. Holy Spirit, under your guidance and direction, under your authority, under the great power of the breaker who wears the title and car who carries the title and wears the crown. Jesus' name. Jesus' name be made whole. Jesus' name be made whole. <laughs> there it is. Oh. Hallelujah. Okay, congregation, stretch out your hand and release your faith for healing. Be made whole right now. This is not a concept. This is a tangible experience. 
Be made whole. Be made whole. Hey, in kumbalis kum de de kumbal kum dabli. Me. Get out of there, arthritis, right now in Jesus' name. Be made whole right now. Whole in Jesus' name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Mark, be made whole. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a concept. It's not a doctrine. It's not in our head. It's coming out of our spirit. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's great freedom and liberty from arthritis. Dissipate, dissolve, disappear. you hear me? I silence the voice. I eradicated the pain in the power of Jesus' name. Whom I am, whom I serve in his authority. Demonstrate. Demonstration of his power. Oh, it's bowing its knee right now. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 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 You got what you came for this morning. Hmm. <laughs> You too. He, 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 he didn't leave you out. You too. <laughs> oh, there it is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Feel that power of peace. My. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Completeness, fullness of your wholeness. In Jesus' mighty name. Be made whole. Son of the Most High God. Set you free today. No more pain. In Jesus' name. <laughs> that anointing dwell in you. Live in you. Abide in you. All the days of your life. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Amaduria city. Nigidigomoro. Imandabrigadigo. That curse was put on you. I don't know how it got on you. It might be generational. But I break its authority. It will, no, it will not continue in your lineage, in your bloodline. In the name of Jesus. He breaks its chains. Hallelujah. Ought to be pain free. To live with no concern. about that symptom any longer the faithful one the faithful one 
the faithful one. The faithful one has spoken this morning. The faithful one has spoken this morning. In Jesus' name. Your best years are ahead of you. In Jesus' name, physically. A restoration of strength. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Your strength will not abate, nor will your eyesight grow dim. In Jesus' name. And that arthritis is ripped from your physical body and flesh. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, you too. I haven't left you out, darling. You too. When the sun sets free, it's free. Today is your new day of freedom. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We'll give the Lord praise in this house. I think we got it, buddy, didn't we? Okay. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Thank you. Who, who do I have left? Anybody? I have this young man right here. Raise your hands. Part the anointing into this physical body to remove every burden and to destroy every yoke to set this captive free be free be free be free in Jesus name amen amen hallelujah well let's all stand Friday, 5 o'clock, right here, candlelight service. Don't miss that. Amen. That tells you since we're huh? we're going to have refreshments, cookies, hot chocolate, all kinds of stuff. Come early, come with an appetite, 5 o'clock. We're only going to keep you for an hour. Then y'all can go home and do Christmas Eve with your family. Amen. That means that Sunday we will not have service here. Okay. And so, uh, Missy and I, the leadership team here, all the pastors, we believe you're going to have a Merry Christmas with you and your family. Amen. You're going to have a great time together. We just speak peace over your gatherings, over your meals. We just thank you, Father, for being in their midst, touching them, blessing them, loving on them. And that it will be a time of great fellowship, of interaction with one another without strife without fussing and fighting, without arguing and debating. Know that, Father, it would just be a time of freedom and that they would have a supernatural experience on Christmas. And we just believe you and thank you for it right now. In Jesus' name, amen. You can drop your connect cards or your offerings at the offering boxes. You're the head not to tell. You're above and not beneath. You're blessed in everything you put your hand to. God's face is shining upon you. He's got a big smile on his face. He loves you. Merry Christmas. And don't forget next time, point someone in the bath.